We are so grateful for Jesus. We're so grateful that you have saved us, that you've redeemed us, forgiven us, and that you've called us your sons and daughters, and that you've given us the great privilege of joining you in bringing others to know the Jesus that we've come to know. And so, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for this team of people here from all of our different four churches who are going to, in a, in a very personal way, be interacting with souls that you are striving with, that your spirit is speaking to and convicting and drawing. Souls also that the devil is working hard to stop from taking the steps with you that they need to take and want to take. And so teach us how to be co-laborers with Christ how to be your ambassadors and people that your spirit can use to encourage these souls in their decisions for truth and for Jesus Christ. Bless our time together, we pray now, and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. What will be our first um, goal in our visitation once the meetings start is to connect with the people on a personal level prior to my having presented the Sabbath. And, and also before or at the same time as we're going through the Antichrist power. Because in the process that, that I do, that I present the series, I've experimented with a lot of different things. And what I find really kind of gets people's interest in people when they come out to a prophecy series, they want Bible prophecy. And they are there for that specific reason, and they want to learn about the big things. They want to know about the rapture, the second coming, they want to know about the Antichrist, those kinds of things. Now, I don't present on the rapture early on because I have found that doing that causes us to lose people. Because evangelical Christianity is so in love with the Left Behind series and that whole disaster that um, they, if they hear anything else they, that doesn't jive with Left Behind, uh, you lose them right away. Uh, and I learned that by hard experience. This is, I'm just teaching you stuff that, you know, that, <laughs> that I learned because I made mistakes. Early on when I joined Amazing Facts, um, I remember it, it was just kind of when the Left Behind phenomenon was still at its peak. And, and I think we were up to about book eight in the series or so, and, and everybody. And, and I, was in, uh, I was in northern Idaho, uh, Coeur d'Alene area, and I was doing a series of meetings, and we had... For the amount of advertising we'd done, we had an incredible turnout. Uh, I think we'd only sent out about 20,000 brochures, and we had 200 non-Adventists come on opening weekend. And we had a great crowd, and it was just jiving. And um, so I'm all excited about this, and I got my whole lineup, and I'm like, okay, we're, we're going to, you know, Left Behind is the big deal, and this is prophecy. So I'm going to do Left Behind before I present the Sabbath. I did Left Behind before I presented the Sabbath, killed our crowd. And right then, I decided that I did not want to really lose people before I presented the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is the big testing truth. And if we can get people past the Sabbath, that is so locked down, airtight, crystal clear in the Bible that you get people past the Sabbath. And, and Ellen White talks about this, and there really is a science to how you do this, but you, you get people past the Sabbath. They, that sets a groundwork and a framework and helps them with other more difficult truths, such as the state of the dead. I never do the state of the dead before I present the Sabbath either, for that reason. State of the dead is an emotional thing. You're telling me that my mommy, my grandmommy, is not up in heaven? Are you crazy? See, and so um, we will lose people for reasons that we don't need to lose them um, prior to presenting the Sabbath. So my rationale, I cover big time prophecy things in leading up to the Sabbath. And one of the things I cover is the Antichrist power. 
And, and so I'm leading up to this to say that I really, as we come, come, come close to the Sabbath message, and we're, and we're dealing with the Antichrist and presenting that and unveiling the, the papal power and so on, I want us to have a personal connection with people, and I want them to know us on a personal level to say, hey, these are nice people. They cared enough about me to stop by. They cared enough about me to ask what mattered to me and pray for my prayer requests. And when they came, they talked to me about salvation by faith in Jesus. <clears throat> See, that's the feeling, that's the experience that I want the people in the meetings to have so that when we start talking about the testing truths, they've got this nice, warm, fuzzy connection with us. Are you with me? Yes. Okay? That's why the visitation in the first week of the meetings is some of the most important that we do, and it's also some of the most time-consuming because this is when most of the people are there. You know, you get farther into the meetings and slowly, little by little, things taper off and people drop out, and so your visitation list gets smaller. But right here at the front, Oh my goodness, it feels overwhelming. I'll be honest with you. You know, it feels overwhelming even to me. But this is the good thing about having lots of teams. It won't be too much for any of us by God's grace. Of course, we would like to have a problem, right? That we get overwhelmed with the response. But in any case, this first visit is all about what I've just talked about. It's about the gospel. It's about um, talking to people about their relationship with Jesus and making sure that they understand that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. And so um, I want to talk with you about doing that gospel visit. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of that, I'm going to give you an opportunity to grab a partner. And we're going to do some role playing. And the role playing is going to be a quick review from our last training meeting, which is where I went through the general stuff that we want to keep in mind as to etiquette at the door. What do we do? For example, do, oh, let me ask you some questions to review. When we come up to the person's house that we're visiting, have we called ahead of time? Yes or no? No. 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 Do not make appointments ahead of time. Very good. And you come tooling up and you drive right on up into their driveway and pull right up to their no. door. No. Nope. So where do you park if you can? That's, on the side street. That's good. That's right. Very good. Park out there. And uh, then when you get out of the car, you leave your open interest list sitting up on the dash yeah. with the name and address and phone number and email of everybody in plain view, right? Yeah. No. Okay. Good. Um, what do you take with you when you go into the house? Bible. Very good. And, and a smile. What's that? And a smile. Very good. And what might you have in your Bible that I recommended that you take with you? A cheat sheet. A cheat sheet. Why do we want a cheat sheet? Because there's some questions you have to memorize, right? Or statements, okay? So how do we introduce ourselves at the door? What's our procedure when we get to the door and we ring the doorbell? Talk to me um, about that. You knock on the door. Firm knock, you step back. Yes. Yep. All right. Okay, so good. It's not in the door. And then we, so, we explain we're in the space. The, and, and I like what you said. What else do you take with you? Smile. Yes, that's right. Big smile. Feels funny. You feel like a clown. They just look and say, oh, here's a happy person. They don't think you're weird, <laughs> okay? Um, yes, okay, what's next? The introduction of why you're there, uh, referencing the uh, Prophecy of Hope Seminar. And, Good. And you. So there are three details that people really, when they see a stranger on their doorstep, three things they want to know. What's the first thing? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? That's yeah. right. What's the next thing? What do you want? Yeah, why are you there? And, and then the third thing, how long are you going to be there? Right. So you're going to answer those three questions in your first statement. And so what I want you to do is role play. Is I want you to role play. One of you is the stranger coming to the door. The other is the person behind the door. And so I want you to go through that whole process. You knock on the door. The, uh, the other person answers it. And then you are going to say, hi, 
My name is George. I'm here with my friend Carlos and Byron Corbett from the Prophecy Seminar that you're attending asked us to stop by and get acquainted. Do you have just a few minutes of time? And that's, your, that, that's, that's the statement. And if you don't remember that and can't say it quite that way, that's on page two, two of your 4D. materials. That's good. 4D. Very good. So take a few minutes and let's role play that. Grab a partner and do that a time or two to each person switching out. One person's the visitor, one person is the visitee, and then swap. And do it a couple times until you feel comfortable, right? And then I'm going to pick on somebody to do it with me. Okay? Do you need a partner? Do you a final? Okay. Grab a partner and let's do role play here for about, I'll give you three minutes here. the bell. May I invite your attention back to the front of the room here. That was good. Uh, how did that feel? Comfortable. Comfortable? Somebody's laughing. Was it comfortable? <laughs> good. So that's why we're going to do some of this role playing because it's easy to listen, you know, listen to me talk about this, but then uh, it's a little different when you start doing it uh, with each other. And that's great practice. Very good. Now, let me see what you remember from last time. So you've done that, you've introduced yourself, they've invited you to come in. Um, what are you gonna do if they stay there at the door after you say, do you have a few minutes of time and they don't invite you to come in? What are you gonna do? You say, may I, you say, may I come in? Yeah, would you, that's right, you just asked them, would, would it be okay if we stepped in for a few minutes? Oh yeah, sure, sure. Or once in a long while, I get somebody that says, you know, I'd rather visit at the door. So I visit at the door, just whatever the case may be. Um, what I don't want to do, if they're willing to stand at the door and talk, I'm willing. I want to have the conversation with them, okay? And, and I've done a gospel presentation on the front doorstep. <laughs> so it's just, that's, that's part of the process. So they let you come into the house. Now you've got to be able to have a conversation with them. How do you go about doing that? What's that? Sure, you look around. Just remember this. Even as they're introducing themselves to you at the door, if the door is open enough for you to see in the house, be looking around to see if there's something that grabs your attention and then ask them a question about it. This is what we call rapport building. And uh, as uh, I was talking with Brother Owen afterwards, he was saying, yeah, and it's all about trust. And we are building a relationship that's based on trust we have only a very short period of time in which to do that so we have to be intentional about doing the things that builds trust and if i am at your house and and we don't know each other but i notice that you have a bunch of pictures of people uh let's say above your mantelpiece or maybe on a table off to the side and, and I see those there, I'm going to think in my head, oh, this is important to this whoever I'm visiting. They've got them displayed. There's a lot of them. This is important to them. So I'm going to walk over to that table, and I'm going to look at the pictures, and I'm going to say, oh, is, is that one of your children? Is that your daughter there? Oh, what's their name? Okay, I'm going to And now what's happening is, I'm building rapport with you because I'm asking you about something that matters to you. And I'm also creating an easy way for me not to have to do a lot of talking, right? Because if it's important to you, you like to talk about it, right? And so I'm just kind of opening the door and say, oh yeah, that's my daughter and she graduated from Plano Senior High School four years ago and now she's you know, finishing up at UT Dallas here in Richardson and, and what her career is. You're going to tell me about that and I'm going to listen to that because we're now connecting on something that's important to you and the feeling that that helps you get is, you know what, there he's interested in what matters to me. And right away, there's a trust that's being built there. They care about what matters to me. They're listening to what's important to me. 
And so that's how you can begin building trust, rapport, in a short period of time. Now, if you don't have something like that that pops out to you that's easy to see, if you look on your page four in your gospel visit instructions, number one that was there, we just did. That's what you do at the door. So you're in the door. Number two, you're looking for that conversation piece. If you don't have that and you're struggling for conversation, remember the acronym FORT, F-O-R-T. And you don't have to do all four of them. You might, you, F stands for family. Ask them about their family. Um, do you have children? Oh, how old are they? Are they? Do they live in the area? You know, just, just follow that train of thought. Family. Second of all, a occupation. What do you do for work? Do you enjoy it? You know, how long have you been doing it? So these are ways that, that you can have that rapport building conversation going. R uh, is about, is, is stands for religion. And you can ask them, you know, hey, what, what's your family's spiritual background? I never say to someone, oh, what church do you go to or whatever? What religion are you? I say, what is your family's spiritual background? So remember that. That's really kind of how you want to ask that question. Uh, what's your family's spiritual background? Okay. And then T is testimony, where you can share your own testimony about how you came to Christ. Now, when you're in this rapport building visit, notice that in number two, what kind of a time frame did I put on this period of time here? Three minutes. Three minutes, yeah. Three, four minutes at the most. Because remember, we're trying to only stay there for 15 minutes, 20 minutes at the most. <coughs> So you can't let this conversation take up a whole huge period of time. Spend about three minutes at it, and, and so you might only get to F in Fort. You might get to O, but don't feel like, oh, F-O-R-T, i got to get through all four. Okay, that's just to help you with different conversation pieces. If they don't want to talk about their family, then I'll try occupation. If they don't want to talk about their occupation, you know, you, you have those different things. So that's the rapport building stage. Once we're ready to move on from that in the visit, how do I get from talking about their kids that they're so proud of to talking about them coming to the meetings? Anybody remember? A transition question. Ooh, he gets an A, a transition question. That's right. This is what we call it. It's the transition question. And Owen, what, what did we do? How did you find out about the Yes, how did you find out about the meetings? That automatically shifts the conversation from my kids over here to the prophecy seminar, prophecy conference that they're coming to. And then they'll tell you, well, I got the brochure in the mail, or, or hopefully, oh yeah, um, Brother Owen gave me a brochure at work and invited me to come, or whatever the case might be. You know, Brother George, or Sister so-and-so. So, so um, we've now transitioned to talking about the meetings, and they've told you how they found out about the meetings. Maybe you ask another question, which would be good. You can always do this. How many meetings have you been able to attend? Okay, because by the time you go see them, we will have had at least three meetings. And most likely, because of the way the schedule is working out this first week with the school, they will, have, they will have been to four meetings. Okay, so say how many meetings you've been able to come to because your their attendance list might show that they only came for the first time on the third night. The attendance report that you get because they may not have registered the first two times and they really did. They say, oh, I've been out to all of them. So you ask them how many meetings they came to, and then after they tell you that, you can also then um, move into the gospel presentation part of the visit. Okay. And that question is simply done by saying, would it be all right if I asked you a spiritual question? And not, you know, 99 out of 100 people are going to say, sure, no problem. And, and if they seem a little hesitant about that, I say, hey, you know, it's, there's no right or wrong answer to this. It's just, uh, just a personal spiritual question. And, uh, and so then people will say, yeah, that's okay. Go ahead and do that. Um, and then from there... If you will turn, I'm going to come back onto page four, but if you will go to page six, I want to show you these two questions that you need to memorize. Okay? Two questions that you got to memorize. One, number one, A and B. Here's 
These are what I call <laughs> diagnostic questions. What does a diagnostic question do? <clears throat> when your doc yes, when your doctor asks you a diagnostic question, what's he trying to do? What's wrong with you? Yes, or what's right with you, right? But yeah, he's trying to figure out your condition, okay? He's doing that about physical stuff. We are doing that about spiritual stuff. We're trying to find out where their heart is with Jesus. Because they may not even really know where their heart is with Jesus, okay? And we don't want to put words in their mouth. We don't want to dis, predis, uh, predispose them to a particular answer. And we don't also want to assume that if they give us a, an affirmative answer, they really understand that properly. So these two questions are intentional. They have been honed by decades of public evangelists uh, using these questions to be able to determine whether or not a person truly understands the basis for their salvation. Okay? First question. Memorize it. Have it on your cheat sheet. Have you come to the place in your life that if you were to die tonight, you have the assurance deep down in your heart that you would be ready to go to heaven with Jesus when he comes? That's the first question. First diagnostic question. Have you come to the place in your spiritual journey that if you died tonight, you have assurance deep in your heart that you could go to heaven when Jesus comes? I don't say when you die. That's how the Baptists do it. But that's not the right way to ask that question because they're not going anywhere when they die, right? They're going in the grave. So I say that you know for sure you'd be able to go to heaven when Jesus comes. Okay, now, right. yes, Steve. Could you rephrase that question to, and, uh, to, say, to ask, uh, if Jesus were to come right now, would you be in a similar way? Right? I mean, because death can be a, such a touchy thing for a lot of people. I mean, I know it's been honed for generations, but could you do it in the context of the second coming? Um... I suppose I've, I've never done it that way. Uh, I always say, I, I often do this. I often say, um, when I say, have you come to the place that if you were to die tonight, I say, and I don't want this to happen, this is just hypothetical. That's what I'll say. I'll say, this is a hypothetical question, all right? And then I go through the question. There's, there's something, and the reason I don't do it just in the context of the second coming is there's something about dying that gets people really serious. Okay. Yeah. More so than just the second coming. Second coming, whatever. But when I think about dying, I'm now really serious. Okay, and that's that's what the, the issue is there. Yeah. Not everybody believes that Christ is coming. Well, so that, that, that could be a thing too. If you go too. there before they even have a foundation of belief that he is, that would be mute for them. Whereas right. this, like you said, death is imminent for all of us as we know it. So that would resonate, I think, in terms of... Yeah, and so, like I say, I will, I'll soften it a little bit by saying, now, this is a hypothetical question, because I don't want this to happen, but are you the place in your spiritual journey that if you died tonight, you know for sure, deep in your heart, that you could go to heaven when Jesus comes? Uh, because, like I said, and even for me, when someone says to you, now, if you died... Da, da, da. I'm, all, I'm really thinking about that. I'm, I'm really looking deep inside. It's, it's a serious uh, watershed. So please do ask it that way. And, and then you're going to get three answers to that question. You're going to get, yes, I know I could go. You're going to get, no, I'm not ready. <clears throat> and then you're going to get people who will say, maybe, or I'm not sure, I don't know. Okay? Those are the three outcomes to that question. That's why we have the second question. Now, if a person says, I don't know if I could go to heaven, or if they say, no, I, I know I'm not ready, I don't really even need to ask the second question because I know they need a gospel presentation. They need to hear how they can have the assurance of Christ. So I can go right into my gospel presentation. But if a person says to me, yes, I know I could go to heaven, 
I now need to find out, this is my second diagnostic question, I need to now find out if they are basing their salvation on faith in Jesus, what he has done for them, or if they're basing their salvation on their own good works. And this is not always clear to people. And this is why we ask this next question. And again, I say this is hypothetical, but imagine yourself standing outside the gate of heaven, and God looks out at you and he says, Byron, why should I let you come into heaven? And he's asking, waiting for you to give him a reason. What would you tell God? What would you tell God? And I wait for them to answer that question. Because this now tells me what they're basing their salvation on. Here's why God should let me into heaven. And people who say to the first question, do you have assurance if you died that you'd be able to go to heaven? People say, oh yes, I know for sure I could go to heaven. When I ask the second question, you would be amazed at how many times people will say, because I'm a good person and I keep the commandments. That's a legalist. That's not a person who's trusting Jesus for their salvation. That's a person who's thinking that the good things they are doing is earning them their salvation. And so it helps us. Now, if I have gotten acquainted with this person and I, and I somehow know that they're a committed Christian, sometimes I, I will come back and say, well, maybe they didn't quite understand the question. So I, I try to rephrase it, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. But that is a wonderful letter B, that question. It's a wonderful diagnostic question. Because as you say, hey, if you're standing at the gate of heaven and God's inside and you want to go in and God looks out and says, why should I let you come into heaven? What would you tell him? What would your reason be? Um, then you will find out. And when people say something like this, and it doesn't have to be exactly these words, but when they say, Byron, I know I'm not worthy to get into heaven, but Jesus died and paid the price for my sins, and I've accepted him as my Savior, then I know they understand the gospel. Okay? And I don't do a gospel presentation with them. I just celebrate the wonderful assurance they have in Christ. If they tell me, um, well, Byron, you know, I just love God and I, you know, I help people and so I, I think he should let me in, then I know that they need to understand the gospel. So then I will do a gospel presentation with them. But that question really helps us drill down and diagnose what they're basing their assurance of salvation on. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Okay. Super good. Let's back up now then, back to um, page four, because I want you to have a clear picture in your mind about who needs this visit on the gospel. Letter th or number three on page four. So um, you can ignore the Sabbath PM part. It says, everyone who attended meeting number three needs a visit. Uh, in this meeting, the way the schedule has worked out, um, meeting number three is going to be on Monday night, May the 9th, because we start Friday the 6th. We have a meeting Friday night and Saturday night. It's Mother's Day on Sunday, and so we thought we probably better not have a meeting. I, I really hated to do that, but anyway. So, Friday, Saturday, we have a meeting. Sunday night, nothing. Monday night, we're back. On Monday night, the message is called the Revelation's Incredibly Good News. And I take a look at Revelation and look at it from a whole different standpoint than anybody ever usually looks at it. When people look at Revelation, they look at all the doom and gloom. What I do is I go through Revelation and I show how Jesus is everywhere, all through the book of Revelation. And I present the salvation, the, the gospel, salvation message in that message. So, that's night three. So here we know, here's how you're going to prioritize your visits in, in number three. First priority, now at the end of that message on night three, we have people turn in a response card. 
where they mark that they've already accepted Jesus or they're accepting him for the first time that they understand that they cannot be saved by their good works. So we have them turn in a little card where they mark the right boxes. It has their name, address, you know, contact information. We will give you those cards so that when you go visit your list, you have the cards for the people that were on the list if they turned a card in and you'll know what responses they gave. Um, so the first priority for our visitation of these people is everybody that came to night three and turned in a response card. That's the top priority visit, okay? So if you're saying, I've got a limited period of time and I've got 12 people to visit and I'm only going to visit eight, I'm only going to be able to visit eight, how do you prioritize? How do you decide who you're going to go see? Top priority are people that turned in a response card. That's priority number one. Priority number two are all the people that their attendance shows that they were at night three, but who didn't turn in a card. They were still there. They still heard the message. We didn't get a card. We still need to clear them on the gospel. That's priority number two. And, uh, and then uh, if you still have time after that, then you can go visit people who are coming regularly to the meetings. They came out the first night, the second night. Maybe they came out the fourth night, but they missed night three. Because we still want to clear them on the gospel. Am I clear so far? Byron, just some logistics uh, questions. Um, and that is, so it's after night three. Yep. They, uh, someone has taken up all the cards. Mm -hmm. Walk us through from that moment until we get our names that we're going to go. What happens in those few little steps between Monday night when they turn the cards in and we get our cards to go visit? Okay. Walk us through those. Good. Logistics. Monday night they're going to turn their cards in. How I envision this happening from a logistical standpoint is... The four pastors or five pastors, we will have to get together on Tuesday. Okay. We will look through the cards and 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 we'll have the visitation teams all set up by then I'm and thinking, the names. Right, right. So we'll make sure that those cards get all divided out and set with the, the different teams. Okay. And then they'll be grouped and at Tuesday night's meeting you can pick the cards up. Very good. So that we don't have to make a special trip somewhere to pick stuff up. But that's kind of how I envision that that's logistically. Fine. So there's a meeting Tuesday night? Yes. But that, and so it's, it's it's so that's when we'll get our cards. Very yeah. good. Okay. Okay. That that's that's gonna be the, the timeline we shoot okay. for. Right. You'll get your cards Tuesday night. Then we have Wednesday night and Thursday night no meetings. Mm -hmm. So that's when we can get those out to start busy. following up on those. Um, and if we don't get all the people followed up before we have meetings again on Friday, we'll still have some time uh, Sabbath afternoon to do a little bit of visiting before the meeting, and particularly Sunday afternoon, because I don't present the Sabbath message until Sunday night. Okay. okay? No, so that's that's what we're looking at. I, I might suggest that on that Tuesday night, uh, somewhere there's a communication that says where we're going to meet to get the cards. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. What, you know, whether it's the back, the front, the you know lobby, the, you know, wh 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 there's a designated spot for us to get the cards. We, yeah, we'll figure that yeah. out when we, because I don't I don't want this happening out in front of everybody. Yes. You know, we right. we need to have some place off the beaten track where. People yeah. can. How am I doing time wise, Keith? 21 minutes. We're left? Left. Okay. All right. Well, number three, we're done on. Let's go down to number four. Let's see. Yeah, I've already talked you through that one. It's just talking about why we want to do these visits in the first week. We want to make the contact before we present the Sabbath message um, and uh, ideally before we do the Antichrist or the Papacy, which Friday night I start. Uh, identifying the Antichrist. Then Saturday night, I talk about how traditions have replaced Bible truth in a lot of church practice, which the obvious next step is Sabbath. And that's what we do on Sunday. So I've got a very intentional progression going on there that we talk about We um, the fourth night is actually my presentation on the great controversy, the war between good and evil, Christ and Satan. And I set it up to point out that the devil's 
the whole principle that the devil operated on when he rebelled against God in heaven was, I'm going to do it my way, not God's way. And so I'm beginning to prepare the people on this issue. Am I going to do it the way God says in the Bible, or am I going to do it a different way? Am I going to do the way man says? And see, that's really what it comes down to when it comes to the Sabbath. Am I going to do it my way, or am I going to do it God's way? And so we, we, we start setting that foundation. Okay, so number five, um, let's see here. Uh, that one I don't have to really worry about too much. You can read through all this again. Please read through it to familiarize yourself with it. Um, but in number five, I'm simply saying if you cover all your meeting number three visits, then your third priority there is to visit people who have come to two or more meetings but who maybe missed the third one. Okay, that's other people that have come to two or more meetings. Um, and you can see I suggest that, again, ask them how many they've been able to attend. Let them know that, hey, we've got the Antichrist coming up on the weekend, and um, sure hope you can come on out, and it's at 7 o'clock and so on. Okay, then um, number six, don't forget to return in your visitation report to me, which is that sheet of paper it's your last sheet in your packet there okay and we'll talk about how to fill this out so you'll understand how this all works uh, we'll do that next Sabbath afternoon um, and by once again I just want to I'm turning the cards in I want to suggest very highly that you let all the visitation teams know where to turn that card in in other words have a box have a envelope have something if it's if it's handed directly to you that's fine, but be very, very direct on where we're to put those at what date and time. Okay, those okay. these reports you the mean? reports, yeah. Okay. Because that's just, I mean, that's your crux of getting your information back. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, and so I think we talked about Steve being the go-to guy. Maybe well, maybe we need to have a different person. Well, I'm, I'm just but, saying, you know, just be yeah, very clear yeah, about it. Right. Don't let okay. that be a confusion. Point. We'll have that figured out <coughs> on Sabbath, uh, okay. on our next training for Sabbath, okay? Yeah. Um, all right, then let's see. Yeah, my phone number's there, number seven. That has my current phone number. If you need to call with any questions, feel free to do so. Now, one of the other things that I want to point out to you, come to page five, and you can read through all of the things that are there. Um, and, and I just want to let you know, I'm giving you this training, I'm giving you this information to prepare you the best I can. And the more time that you spend memorizing those questions that I tell you to memorize, the better off you're going to be. Trust me, it works that way. But I also want to say this. Every situation is different. Yeah. And don't feel like it's all on you. You're going to pray before you go into that home. And you're going to ask the Holy Spirit to use you and speak through you. So trust the Holy Spirit. You know, don't get all stressed out and, oh, I didn't do that question perfectly or, oh, whatever, you know. Let the Holy Spirit be in charge because He will guide you through those <clears throat> moments in the visit. And when you're sitting there and you don't have a clue what to say, you breathe a little prayer, the Holy Spirit will come to your aid. And so I really want to encourage you, prepare. There's no substitute for preparation. You know, if I didn't memorize my Bible verse, the Holy Spirit can't remind me of what it says, right? But if I memorized it, even though if it was 10 years ago and I forgot it, the Holy Spirit can bring that back up in my head. So you do your preparation as best you can, and then you trust the Holy Spirit after that. And, and so I just want to kind of sort of somehow take a little bit of pressure off, not to let you just be irresponsible and slackers, but to say, hey, I'm not doing this all by myself. And it's not about me, it's about me letting the Holy Spirit flow through me. And partner up with the Holy Spirit and have fun. And you're going to walk out of that and, and you're going to have, and this has happened to me so many times, still does. Even though I've been doing this now since, uh, let's see, I got out of Southern when I was in 1992. Okay, well, yeah, I don't have to do the math. I've been in ministry almost 24 years. I've been doing this for 24 years. I still get in situations where I don't know exactly what to do or say. And then I get amazed at what I hear coming out of my mouth. Because the Holy Spirit just comes up with something. And you're like, wow, 
that was pretty good. And you know it wasn't you, because you, you had a blank mind, you know? And you have to give all the credit to the Lord. And it's just humbling. And it's important that we remember that, because it's not us, man. It's God all over the place. And this is just awesome times for God to work. So, um, you're going to need, at times, to be able to interrupt people. And it's okay. If you get into a home where they're a big-time talker, and you're in your rapport building, and they're so into their motorcycles, if it's a guy, I've had guys, you know, they're talking about their Harley, man. And I mean, people who have Harleys, they're like hardcore. I think it's a cult or something, you know. <laughs> you know, and, and so I, I you, and, and we're taught not to interrupt, right? When somebody's talking, you let them talk. But when they've been talking for four minutes, and they haven't even come up for air, you know, and, and they're about to suffocate. It's merciful to interrupt them, to give them a time, you know, a chance to catch a breath. So, so you just, you know, you just look for a little break or sometimes you just have to talk over them. I've had to do that. I've just had to say, you know, I, this is so awesome. But tell me, how'd you find out about the meetings? Just right on top. So sometimes you're going to have to do that. All right. Um, and then when you're leaving, number nine on page five, when you have closing prayer, Ask them if there's anything they would like you to pray for. And then be sure that you pray for that when you pray. At times, I've been training folk with me and giving them the opportunity. They're going to lead out. They're going to pray. We get the prayer request. They pray. They never mention the prayer request. Now, as their trainer, I just do a little PS prayer on the end, and I pray for that thing, okay? And so if your partner that you're visiting with is leading, and they forget to pray about the prayer request, the partner, do your little PS. Pray for that prayer request that they brought up, okay? Um, we already talked about number 10. Don't talk or visit or say anything until you're in your vehicle, rolls up, windows rolled up, and you've driven 50 yards down the road. Then you can start talking. Now, something that I didn't put on the page, but I want to mention, so if you want to write this down, it's number 11. It is critical. It is, what did I say? Critical, critical that you do not go ahead of me in the meetings. What do I mean by that? Some people are going to be so pumped about the meetings. They're going to be loving it. And they're going to say, I haven't covered the Antichrist yet. And they're going to ask you, well, who's the Antichrist? That's coming up on Friday. Can you just tell me who's the Antichrist? Now, just because I'm going to tell them who it is, you can't do it. Okay? Uh, or, or, they're, or they're going to ask you about, well, well what, what really happens when somebody dies? And, and when I was new at this, I thought, wow, here's a wide open invitation. This is a person seeking, they want to know truth. And I would answer that question, never see him back at the meetings. Mm -hmm. So, under no circumstances, no matter how interested do they appear, no matter how excited about the meetings they are, under no circumstances do you talk about anything that I have not yet covered in the meeting, that I haven't preached about. Okay? All you can do is you, you can say, you know what, that's a great question. I think Byron is going to be covering that on a night coming up soon, so let's just wait until he covers it. Tell him it's a good question. Byron's going to cover it. Do you understand the importance of this, though? Don't go ahead and talk about anything that I haven't covered yet. Yes, sir. What if, they, what if they make the comment, I think the speaker is a Seventh-day Adventist? That's okay. What do you say? What do you respond to that? What I respond to people is I tell them this. I have, and, and, and God gave me this answer one day. I said to them, I said, you know what? My first loyalty is to Jesus Christ. My second loyalty is to the Word of God. And my third loyalty is to where the Word of God took me, and that's why I'm fellowshipping with the Adventist Church. The reason, the reason why I asked that question, because in a, in a prior prophecy seminar, when, it, when we transitioned from, uh, I think it was a hotel, to the church, I was sitting next to someone who, who leaned over to me and said, I think these guys are Seventh-day Adventists. And I have my share of that. <laughs> Same question. So, so if they lean over to that and, and say to them, you say, you know what? You could be right. 
But he's talking from the Bible, right? You know? Um, don't, don't let it embarrass you. Don't let it put you on the defensive. Uh, but but don't don't feel like you have to like tell a white lie or something. I don't want to do that. Yeah, you, you know, just so we're clear, if you feel uncomfortable with you, uh, answering that question, um, just you know say, hey, why don't you just ask Byron? Sure. Yeah. Send him my direction. Yeah, but, but let me. <laughs> mine, is, you know, mine is a little more simple, which is, is there an intent to avoid the? Is there an intent to avoid disclosing that the speaker and the event is hosted by Seventh-day Adventists? Is, is there some strategic intent not to disclose that? No, we... My answer to that is yes and no, all right? I, I am not trying to hide anything, but here's Ellen White's counsel. If you read the book of Evangelism, she says that when we go into an area to begin to present the three angels' messages, the truths that God's given us to prepare the world for Jesus to come, she says that we should not feel it a burden to immediately tell people who we are because of prejudice. Okay? So uh, Jesus told his people that he healed oftentimes, what did he say to them? Don't tell anybody who did this. Why? And Ellen White is clear in Desire of Age because he knew that the priests were prejudiced against him, and if they told who did it, then they would say, well, no, you didn't really get healed, and they wouldn't acknowledge that, right? And so it's our responsibility to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. I don't ever want to go anywhere where there's an untruth. I'll get your hand in a sec, Keith. I don't want to do anything that smacks of telling lies, but we don't also have to feel that we just have to put it out there. We need to let people develop trust. And after they've been hearing these messages and they see it's all coming from the Bible and they're under conviction, there's, I can trust these people. Then it's going to be a different matter to, to talk about the denomination. What you're dealing with is not whether or not they know you're an Adventist. What you're dealing with is whatever the perception of a Seventh-day Adventist is that they have. And there's no way to know what that is. That's right. So when you say, yes, he's a Seventh-day Adventist, you're saying yes to whatever is in their heads, good, bad, or indifferent, yeah. about yeah. being a Seventh-day Adventist. And it may not be accurate, which is the whole reason for the crusade. Let's be accurate. Let's deal with where this is. And if I have in my mind a, a, a knowledge that these are the folks that were at Waco. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is just yeah. a couple hours down the road, which right? Just a couple hours down the road. Right, right. And now they're coming here. If I have that in my yeah, mind, right. and that is what is the lasting thing about a Seventh-day Adventist, then when I say yes, I can't hear Byron anymore. I can't hear it. Yeah. And what we're wanting, not the name, what we're wanting is the word of God to stand up That's and right. be heard That's and right. let it speak for itself. And you can call us Excelsior if you want to, as long as the Church of Excelsior is studying the word of God, that's where it is we're trying to get. Can okay. You, yeah. Can you tell me where in Desire of Ages Ellen White makes that statement? I don't know off the top of my head, but we, we can we can research that oh, up for you. Well, it, no, there's no, two. It's Desire of Ages they're two. they're both. Yeah, they're both. Yeah. When if you read about if you if you go look up in a concordance, um, where Jesus healed and said, "Don't don't tell." Okay. And, and then find the chapter, then go into the Desire of Ages and find the chapter where it says this chapter is based on Matthew 13, let's say, where that story happened. You'll probably find her comments relative to that in those chapters in Desire of Ages. In the book of Evangelism, again, I can find it. I don't remember off the top of my head because I, I was researching this years ago when I first started out because I was trying to find my way to say, okay, you know, I know that people are so prejudiced about Adventists. They have all these weird ideas. And what Keith said is so true because you say you're an Adventist. They're saying, oh, well, you're the people that don't, don't believe in a flag and you don't believe in blood transfusions and, and, and you're Mormons, right? 
I mean, they have all this stuff totally confused with who Adventists are. And so, yeah, when you say, I'm an Adventist, that's what they think. But after they've heard a bunch of messages that come straight from the Bible, and they're convicted of the heart, and then they hear you're an Adventist, now an Adventist is this here instead of that stuff. So, so I don't make it a point to hide, but I also don't throw it out there. Rebecca. Hi, everybody. My name is Rebecca. Um, and I'm um, just baptized by Pastor Corbett um, last Sabbath. I just want to say that, um, that I go to um, a non-Adventist university, and they know I'm Adventist. And so they have that notion about Adventist. However, we're living in the time where I think Joel says, in the last days, I'll pour my spirit on you. Your young men and your daughters and all that will see visions and dream mm-hmm. dreams. So they might have that notion about us, but we're living in a time where the Lord is bringing us to a point where they want to. I, I do a sermon on the Sabbath Monday for my school. There's people coming in that I don't know. Because they want to, a lot of them, they want to hear this message. And I just want to give a, I don't want to take just 30 more seconds. Um, we all had to take a national Bible exam. The national average for this Bible exam amongst universities is a 53%, okay? I wind up on this national exam in my school. No, I made a 90.67 on this mm-hmm. national exam. All the Adventists, I bet you, will make a 90.67. We know our word. So because of that, now these people are like, wow, shoot. 15 you know, seconds, no longer, Rebecca. I'm uh, holding you to Adventist, it. <laughs> this Adventist must know the Bible. Mm-hmm. So in the last days, I hear what Pastor Gray is saying, but also the spirit is going mm-hmm. before us. Yeah. It's going to march around the place seven times and the walls are going to drop. Beep, so we no beep, longer got to be ashamed of the gospel. He's elevating us in these last days. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you did pretty good. 35 seconds. <laughs> Okay, that's, I'm just, we got five minutes left here, and I want to I wanna stick with that. So um, let's then, again, why don't I want you to go ahead? It's not because I'm God and I'm so cool and so special. It's just that people can only handle so much at a time. It's like indigestion. If we give them too much, and in the house, when they have a question, you only have a couple minutes to give a little short answer. And if it's something different than they've known all their lives, they're not going to be able to accept that. And they're just going to throw it out right now. I have in the meeting, I have 45 minutes, 50 minutes, 55 minutes to build the case and take them through step by step and ease this in so that by the time we get to the end, they can't argue with it. But you don't have that opportunity in the house on a short question. And that's why I say don't go ahead of what we've talked about in the meetings. Okay, very good. Uh, Back to page six. Here's what I want to have you work on because we'll pick this up on uh, May 6th in our training. Start looking at number two, three, and four and the salvation prayer on page number six. When you present the gospel, there are a few key points that you want to make. Five points I've boiled it down into. You don't have to read all of these Bible verses. If you try to read every one of these Bible verses with the people you're talking to, mm-hmm. you're going to be there a lot more than 20 minutes. Okay, You can't do that. Uh, I have these there so that you can see the scriptural basis for what we're saying. And you can have it in your head and you can know what it is. But I go through and I present these basic points to the people. And I, use, I like to use one Bible verse. And I was going to say, if there's one Bible verse that I had to use that I think is the most balanced presentation of the gospel, it's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Because it starts out, For by grace we've been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that nobody can boast establishes a firm foundation on faith in Christ, not works. But then in verse 10, it follows up to say, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So to me, it presents the the best balance of the gospel that we are not saved by our good works. We're saved by faith in Christ, 
But in a genuine saving relationship with Jesus, it's going to produce the fruit of what? Obedience, right? And that's, that's the gospel presentation. You can see it there. Then when you get to the end of that presentation, um, you have to close the deal. And you simply do that by saying, would you like to receive Jesus into your life right now and have the wonderful assurance of this, of your salvation? That if you died tonight, you could go to heaven. Now, most of the time they're going to say yes. Then you kneel down with them, lead them in the salvation prayer, which I have at the bottom of the page. Do your best to memorize that. Have a cheat sheet. Okay? Um, if they say no, that they don't want to do that right then, that's their choice. Now, that, that's going to kind of, we're going to feel like, oh, this is so sad, right? Um, and, and so my response when they say no is to say, you know, I really appreciate you, you sharing honestly with me, and, and I can respect that. But I hope you'll think seriously about this, about this decision because Jesus wants you to have that wonderful assurance in your life. And you don't know how many more opportunities you're going to have to do that. So just really think about that. And, uh, and then I encourage them to keep coming to the meetings. And I say, you know what, I'm going to be praying for you. And I'll ask them, do you have any special prayer requests as I get ready to go now? So, so we'll, we'll walk through this again in a little more detail um, on Sabbath afternoon. But get familiar with those things there. And then uh, also, I'm going to walk you through how to read this sheet next Sabbath afternoon, the Trackham Legend Sheet, because this is what you're going to get. Your visitation list is going to look like the top half of that sheet of paper. And if you want to go ahead, you can look at that. I give you a key below that explains what each column is. But we'll do that, and then I'll tell you how to fill out this form, and we'll tell you where to turn it in and stuff. All right? I think we're wound up, Keith. Isn't that right? We are 40 seconds over. 40 seconds over. All right, let's pray. Lord God, I want to thank you so much for the wonderful meal that Acts 2 provided for us. Lord, just blessed us in a physical way. And now I thank you for the precious time that we've had together here to... Uh, practice our meeting people at the door and to learn again what's going on in people's minds what's happening in their homes as we visit with them and how to be most effective in pointing them to Jesus helping them understand that they are saved by faith in him and to have that beautiful assurance in their lives as we continue to incorporate these skills into our lives I pray that your Holy Spirit will bless in a mighty and powerful way and equip us to be the people that answer the prayer of Jesus, that go into the harvest to bring that harvest home. Thank you for your love. Bless the families here this coming week, God, and uh, be with us especially as we meet Wednesday night to prepare for our opening night at Erickson Middle School. In Jesus' name, amen.